You are listening to the Living Room Disciple Podcast. We aim to model the discipleship conversations that should be happening on couches and around dining room tables. We're trying to grow our imaginations to think of what could and should be as we follow Jesus. We're asking ourselves tough questions about how we are being formed by the world around us. And we're inviting you to listen in. If you find this episode helpful, the best thing you could do is share it with one person and start a conversation with them. But also liking and subscribing, leaving a review, these are all things that are really helpful in growing the podcast and letting more people hear it as well. So it'd be great if you did that as well. All right, on to today's episode. Okay, so Phil, you came to me with an idea for today's episode, and I am intrigued to see where it goes. I hope our listeners are too. So talk to us about what you think about Christians and cursing. This is the first time, uh, it's been a while since I brought a topic up. I feel like you've been our topic yeah. generator lately, and I appreciate that. It makes um, me sound like a an app. <laughs> <laughs> Let's plug it into the topic generator. <laughs> uh, Nick GPT. Um nice. Okay, so I, I've been thinking about cussing, uh, like the topic of cussing, the intersection, one may say. Wow, it feels between, so academic. <laughs> cussing in the Christian faith for a very long time. In fact, I would say mm. this is one of the first formation topics like I kind of wrestled with early in the faith because mm. I can't tell you the number of times. I've probably said this so many times. I've heard people say this. I've done a lot of work. It's been one of my favorite joys to work with new believers, right? So people who have recently come to the faith, just sitting next to them, hearing their story, being a part of those early steps is, is something I'm really, really passionate about. And I've heard a lot of testimonies. And a part of the testimony process, I think, in, in the American evangelical world, and I don't think there's anything wrong with this, not a criticism, is to often talk about like, the types of behaviors I demonstrated prior to coming to Christ, and then the types of demonstrate the types of behaviors I demonstrate post coming to Christ. And early on in my walk, I started to pick up that one of the common denominators, like one of the things that kept coming up, is people would say something to the effect of, and, and I stopped cursing, right? That something about entering into a relationship with Jesus meant that I needed to stop using the F-bomb or something along those lines, right? And and then likewise, sometimes when talking with people who are struggling, they feel like a sense of struggling in their faith. They would bring up, man, like I'm, I'm cursing more or something to that effect. They would often use things like, oh, I don't watch movies or listen to music in which there's cussing. And so I feel like much of my time in the evangelical church in America, there's been a hyper focus on whether or not we say certain English words. Hmm. And there's something that correlates that to, to, to faithful discipleship of Jesus. Am I crazy? Like, have you seen this, Nick? I've absolutely seen it. Okay. And I don't think cussing really... I don't want to say it doesn't matter. And we're going to dive into like how, I'm, but I do not see in scripture a correlation, a convincing correlation, because we could talk about some verses between using um, what our society would consider, you know, curse words and someone's faithful walk with Jesus. In fact, I think that someone could be a faithful, mature follower of Jesus, somebody that others should say, I want to follow them as they follow Christ, and they can frequently use uh, cuss words that you would see, that, that society would consider cuss words. Wow, fascinating. I, I think that is a a, a hot take for it sure. Is, right? and And something that uh, I think a lot of people would... Uh, push back on yeah, you oh, in uh, the yeah. American evangelicalism yeah. that that we both find ourselves a part of. And so, tell me more about why you think that and how you came to that conclusion. I well, I, the, there's just not scripture that supports it. And yeah. um, I think hmm, I'm trying to remember who said it. Um, there's a quote, something, something to the effect of like, uh, if if Satan can't get you to, you know, uh, not follow Jesus, he'll distract you in the process or, or something to that effect. And, and Mm. C.S. Lewis kind of gives us some beautiful analogies in, in the screw tape letters to this effect. 
Um, I think this is an example. I think that yeah, one of the things that we're notorious for in the evangelical church is we begin a following of Jesus, and then we begin to excuse ourselves from radical following of Jesus. Yep. And to do that, we have to um, create metrics for success, like what what is successful following Jesus look like? And oftentimes those metrics don't align with the word of God, which is where a lot of our poor discipleship comes from. This is one of the things I have against, or yeah, I would say against, in a loving way against, like in a loving prophetic way against the church. So for example, I would say that to discern whether or not a church is effective by the number of individuals who attend that church, I would say that's a poor metric for success. And that leads down the road to uh, bigger issues. Right. This is an example. I think that um, we created a culture in the church at some point. I'm sure there's some good reason for it because there's usually good reason for it that would indicate that, man, if you speak in this way, it's probably not going to be somebody who follows Jesus. Hmm. And we need to adjust the way we speak, which is true. I I want to talk about what types of speech we should be using. But a metric for success in following Jesus became like, you know, I don't use the S word, the B word. I mean, gosh, even now, like I don't want to use these words on a Christian podcast because I care about our audience. I do love you all and I don't want to offend you. Right. And there are some words that are, are really toxic and, and harmful to culture. And we could talk about that too. But but because that becomes a metric for success in our following of Jesus, we create an environment in which we can say, well, I'm, I'm successful because I don't do this, where that's never a success metric that, that the Lord gives, right? It would appear that if you look in the Sermon on the Mount, success metric is still a, a hard thing to use, but some of the behaviors that we're told are not not using curse words. They're giving to the poor very sacrificially and in a way that maybe others wouldn't know about and you wouldn't be able to get any credit. Praying and, and fasting, um, forgiving. Uh, these are the types of behaviors uh, and more that would be indicative of somebody who is a follower of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so if you're somebody who says sugar sticks instead of something else, <laughs> But your heart sugar is, <laughs> sugar, I don't know, you know, fudge muffins yeah. or shiitake mushrooms <laughs> or I don't know, whatever, you know, other crazy thing. Because our heart conditions are the same, exactly. whether or not we say shiitake mushrooms or the S word. But anyway, yeah. um, but if we're somebody who, 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 who monitors our language and yet is, is not giving sacrificially to the poor, we're still like really investing far more in a 401k than we are into, mm. um, you know, those who are without you know, uh, houses in our community, Mm -hmm. then you're just like, you know, like way more wicked and a way farther away from God. They take someone who curses like a sailor and yet is sacrificially giving to the poor and they are praying and fasting and forgiving often and right. Like they just constantly forgive those who've hurt them. Like that person's far more in right relationship to Mm -hmm. God. And and I don't, there's no biblical evidence. But if they walked into the average evangelical church, most people would judge oh, them exactly yeah. the opposite way. We don't care what you've done. Yeah. If you talk like that, you're, you're not really part of us. This has been an issue, uh, not cursing specifically, but the disconnect between what Yahweh finds is acceptable behavior hmm. and what the organized yeah. religious wow. system that that is appointed by Yahweh hmm. to serve Yahweh uh, what they find acceptable and what Yahweh finds acceptable, that has been intention since the since Moses, you know, I'm like, mm. really, you know what I mean? Um, and so, and that's never going to go away. Um, it just means that we can't look to that system always to identify what is pleasing Yahweh. And so if you are, are, are inside your church community and they're indicating that cursing is wrong, that doesn't necessarily mean it is, hmm. unfortunately. Pick this apart, maybe. Push back. Right? You, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Well, so I have a couple thoughts. The first one is we did, I think over the summer, correct me if I'm wrong on that, I think over the summer we did the, our series on political formation yeah, and how we might be formed by different ideologies that we hold and different different policies that would cause us to vote a certain way. Not just what 
what should we be voting for? What policies should we be for and against? But how are we formed by those things? Mm -hmm. And I think you would probably agree that our common refrain on every single episode was it's more about the heart yes. than what you actually vote for. Yeah, way more. Um, the kind of person you're becoming and whether or not your heart is in alignment with the will of God and, and the way of Christ and yes. the moving of the Holy Spirit is so much more important than which box you check on a piece of paper. Yep. And so I think I see a lot of similarities with mm -hmm. that conversation and what we're talking mm -hmm. about here, mm -hmm. where honestly, it is really easy and takes a lot of the kind of wrestling and, and difficulty of knowing people well out of the equation. Yeah, it, it makes things easier if we can simply say that person curses, that person drinks, yeah. that person smokes, or in more in more extreme cases, even that person dances, that person gambles, that person plays cards, yeah. um, that person has a tattoo. <clears throat> We've had a movement that emphasizes purity of the outward um, symbols, I think, of Christianity, <laughs> as opposed yeah. to an inward posture of the heart that actually is really, really, really hard to discern. It's easy yeah. to see that person has a tattoo or I heard that person say a cuss word. Those things are really easy. I think it's really difficult to look at the person with the tattoo or to, to have a conversation with the person who's cursing and to discern the godliness of their heart, whether they've been transformed by the spirit. And so I think there's a temptation in us to skip the hard work for the easy work. And that's true in almost everything. Yes. But I think in this case, it can really cause us to miss out on seeing the image of God in people and even the sibling status of other people as fellow Christians, because we mark them a certain way simply because they have some, some sort of outward sign. Mm -hmm. And we're not willing to do the work of really discerning what righteousness is there. Yes. And, and I think, so you're already getting to, and this is the through line for a lot of my thinking, and, and, and I know yours too, like, hmm. it, it's far more about the heart posture than the outward evidence. And the outward evidence will positively flow from a good heart posture. I want to be clear too, because I also remember, you know, there's some people thinking uh, certain individuals are coming to mind, Mark Driscoll, for example, you know, in this, you know, mid 2000s, kind of like punk grunge movement that Christianity <laughs> had, where they started throwing around the F-bomb as like a an attention getting type strategy. So if you're a disciple of Jesus, you relate to other humans by posturing yourself in, into a position of service to them. Okay. You say that I will, I will be what you need to be because my personal identity is so founded in Christ. I don't need to, to modify it mm. or I don't, I I'm okay to modify my outward behaviors in, in a way that's as long, you know, they're in alignment with love. Let me give an example. I, I don't think cussing is a problem and I very rarely cuss because it's my wife doesn't really like that language. Most of my church community would feel offended or create confusion or people would think wrongly about my relationship to God because of those words. So I choose not to cuss because I choose loving on the person in front of me, but that's not always true in every setting. You know, there have been times where I've been sitting across the table from someone uh, who, who I know well, and I know what their comfort level is with words and other things, mm. and they're going through a really tough time. And sometimes, I, I heard it said once, uh, just use bad words for bad things and good words for good things. It's really important to remember that there's, there really can't be a scripture saying you shouldn't cuss right. because there's no cuss words in Hebrew uh, or Greek, really. So it's, that's kind of like a, it's a thing that we've invented, as it were. Instead, you'd use really graphic imagery for really graphic things. I mean, uh, Yahweh tells the Pharisees that their offerings are like bloody menstrual rags. Okay. It's a really graphic image to convey the disgust that he has at the way they're offering it in this hypocritical way. It's really rough language. It's like really gross and rough language. And it's intended to be that way. So, you know, I'm talking to this individual who, you know, is experiencing grief and mourning and to, to use language to say, man, that's so, you know, crappy, but maybe language that's a little sh more extreme doesn't for that individual 
doesn't make them feel distant from God, makes them feel more intimate and close to God because it's someone who understands they're using extreme and graphic language to accurately represent the difficult and extreme and graphic time they're going through. Mm. It's just adjusting my language to the person in front of me, not putting boundaries to my love for someone else because of my own comfort language with words or not words. That's really important. And that does it for... mm, because I can already hear somebody maybe disagreeing with me. And I fully respect the fact that hmm. um, some would say that I don't need to use cursing to relate to someone else. And, and that's fair, but <laughs> perhaps. I just want to say perhaps. But but there's a there's a framework and openness for enough individuals in this world that for some they'll they will feel more seen and more understood when spoke, you know, when spoken to in a language that they use and understand. And so holding my language up as a tool for God to use and allowing him to shape what words come in my mouth. Francis Chan actually was one of the first people I hear talk about this and give me some level of validation right. many years ago. I had a, men- oh, I, I had a woman in my life who, who had a level of mentorship in my life. And hmm. she was talking to me how disappointed she was that she had heard Francis Chan, you know, use a curse word, you know, cause she had such respect for him and she thought he was so mature. Um, it was like 2012 or, or something that I heard, you know, that I was talking to this woman about this. And that was my first time of like being jarred that, you know, he, he had used that language in, in a sermon um, and I had listened to it and I, I felt like it made sense. It felt like he was using a bad word for a bad thing and it felt like there was a level of continuity. And so it spoke to me and, and I was like, I get that, you know? But for this individual, it had been so jarring that she made it an evaluation on his spiritual uh, maturity right. based on his willingness to use that language. And I think that was my first moment of like feeling like, well, there's not, you're making a correlation that scripture isn't. What's mm-hmm. the correlation we're supposed to be making? I'm ranting now. Stop me. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's really interesting. I think you could say that Francis Chan went too far in exactly what you were describing earlier, that maybe you shouldn't curse because there are people for whom they're not going to hear anything you yeah. say for the rest that's of the sad. sermon because... But on the flip side, she obviously should not judge the fruit of his spiritual life based on one word that came out of his mouth. And I think I think there's nuance here and probably a lot more <laughs> nuance than most Christian communities would, would talk about because I think in the English language, there is a history of curse words coming from either talking about vile things and it was so vile that the words themselves began to carry that very vileness all the way to religious meanings, such as the word damn comes directly from <laughs> religious, like it is, it is a religious proclamation on somebody. And if you include the title of God in in that, it becomes a, uh, you might say, blasphemous or even taking the name the, the name of the Lord in vain. And so there there is a history of curse words that we don't really consider to be religious anymore. Mm-hmm but that have their roots in religious kind of the desacralization of the sacred. And so we should be careful with things like that. Mm. But I, I think also if, if you've never read the book, what's it called? Bearing God's name, I think by Dr. Carmen Imes, it's a fascinating look about how the commandment about don't take the Lord's name in vain. Actually the, the Hebrew language much more closely says, do not, do not falsely, bear the name of God. In other words, when you're, when you are God's light to the Mm. nations, when you are carrying the name of Yahweh to others, do not do it in a way that betrays God's true character. And so again, we're back to, it's easy to avoid saying, taking God's name in vain in the way that you would, I don't want to say it on mic, right? Yeah. It's easy to avoid that or judge people who do that. And, and maybe that's right, but it's harder to do the work of saying, am I living a life in accordance with God's character in such a way that I am bringing God's light to everyone that surrounds me. That's what it means to carry the name of Yahweh or the name of Jesus. And I think it's the same, the same pratfall of it's really, it's easy to avoid never stringing a certain order of words in the, in order. It's harder to really live a righteous life that shows this is who God is. And you can tell because you see so much love in me. Maybe this is the time in which we should turn the page a little bit and talk about what what are the boundaries (music) 
Here at the Living Room Disciple, we have been in prayer for all those affected by the devastation of Hurricane Helene. And this is a storm that touched close to home for us as our dear co-host Kelsey lives in a community that was deeply impacted, which is why you may be hearing her voice a little bit less often on the next several episodes. Now as her community and many others like it continue to rebuild, we wanted to ask two things of you. First, would you make a conscious decision to not forget and move on? To continue in prayer for these communities and for those suffering and struggling? to pray for those who are trying to practice the gift of presence in these communities, a ministry of listening and connecting. And secondly, would you consider donating to a reputable organization that has their hands and feet on the ground in these devastated areas? We asked Kelsey who she's seen doing great work in her area, and she recommended both Samaritan's Purse as well as the Adopt a Need initiative in Western North Carolina. The link to each of those is in the show notes, and I hope that you will consider supporting these communities, whether that's in prayer, with your finances, or both. Now, back to the episode. So I feel like the first half of this conversation is maybe making an argument that words don't matter, but that's not what I think. I do think that words have a a, a huge importance, and so I I personally think there probably are some words that are off limits, but I think there's more principles to think about and to look at. And the principles should help us discern what our yeah. heart condition is. Yeah. I think that's the key, right? Developing principles that don't that, that aren't focused on barring off certain words, but are focused in on ensuring I'm checking my heart condition. And then as a byproduct, there are going to be certain words barred from that. So I, I think it actually should be noted. I t- this is what I tell my kids. There's no rule in the, in the, in our home for no cursing. We don't say that, w- which means, you know, sometimes kids say the darndest <laughs> things and you might be surprised what comes out of my kids' mouths. But, and this is the key, we have really big, very clear, we spend a lot more time talking about the way and the, and the purpose in which we're saying something, right? So in our home, if you call someone stupid, you'll probably be disciplined to the same level that some yes, people in another home might good. say the F-bomb. Because I don't really care about the word. I care about the heart condition. And that's the first thing. What is? It, I never want language to come out of right. my mouth that's intended to harm another. Yeah, that's, that's guideline one. Never have a word that comes out of my mouth that's intended to harm, insult another. In fact, let, this has very clear biblical mm-hmm. kind of foundations, right? It's, you know, don't say the S word. Can't really point to a scriptural passage, although there is one passage we need to talk about before we're done. And I know many people are, are thinking already. But so if you jump over to Matthew chapter five, Jesus is talking, this is the, the Sermon on the Mount. We're in the beginning, kind of in the introductory period of the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about salt and light. He talks about the fulfillment of the law that he's come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it or to fill it full, as they would say. And he talks about murder. You've heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. Anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, man, they're going to be in danger of the fires of hell. So why do I bring this up? Jesus is painting a picture throughout much of of the early part of the Sermon on the Mount, and in fact, all of the Sermon on the Mount, that our heart condition is the core uh, indicator about our our right right relationship to God. And and we talk about that a lot on this podcast. Specifically, he says, if your outward behavior is offensive to another person, uh, not just murder, but but if you're angry with them, you're you're willing to, to say, you fool, like just call them an idiot. Right? That, right there. Just you're willing to call them an idiot. You you are willing to use your words to degrade their humanity in yeah. any way. In any way. You are in dangers of the fire of hell. So that's the first guideline. Ooh, can I interrupt you real quick? Our language is I just thought yes, of the please. verse in James where it talks about the tongue cannot be controlled. Oh, and yeah. the metaphor he uses is it is a it's an instrument that's been set on fire by hell. So it's not so oh, so I wonder if wow. Jesus in Matthew 5 is not just saying if you say stuff like that you're going to burn forever. <laughs> but if he's saying 
oh, you yeah, currently here and now are living like hell on earth, <laughs> right? Pun not intended yeah. in a conversation about, about cursing, but you're living as if hell has set your tongue on fire by degrading another human being in front of your face here and now. Yes. So yes, and, and this is true, and it's the key. This is true whether you use a curse word like the B word or whether you just say in the car, you idiot, to yeah. somebody cut you off. Or if you just think that person is just stupid. Because of or, who they're voting for. <laughs> or, because of who they're voting for, right? Like, and I, like this is the thing. It's not about mm -hmm. the word. It's not about the word, which is why getting focused on curse words is so frustrating and not helpful. Because it's not about the word. It's about, do you see... Do you believe it is okay in that moment to use any word or thought to degrade another human? That's the focus. And so in our home with my mm -hmm. kids, that's what we focus on. I know, I don't even know if my kids know right. curse words exist. And that doesn't mean like they've heard the words that others would call curse words, but I don't think they would be able to identify right. that as a curse word. But they they know what language is acceptable mm -hmm. and not acceptable in our home, Right calling someone dumb or uh, yelling at them, I hate you. Those are just real, like we discipline really rough, honestly, and for those statements, uh, because I'm very concerned with the types of language that's being allowed in our home. And I'm mm -hmm. not talking about curse words. I'm talking about, is it to build up? I'm going to look up this verse now. Is it to build yeah. up or Ephesians to bring down? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, that's literally not true. <laughs> Yeah. So, so that's the first you know, guideline is, is using words to build up, which will inherently exclude some yeah. social words. So there are words that, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I, I don't think so. There are some words that inherently, because of our social context, carry with them an immediate feeling yeah. of degradation, you know, degrading. Th these are slurs uh, often these are slurs against races, eth ethnic groups, and genders, or mental you, you, you disabilities. Know, um, so you know, mm -hmm. or mental disabilities, right? And so these are terms that I can't think of a context in which they could ever right. be used to build up. Curse word or not, that's not the point. They just can't. I don't right. think they could be used to build up. And so because of that, because of that, we we can't. They become. Uh, off limits mm -hmm. unless we're using them in a scholarly way to document what was said or something but you, you know to use that mm -hmm. was an inherently degrading yeah, term absolutely so i think i think you're spot on and i'm thinking of our conversation with karen swallow prior she wrote a book called the evangelical imagination that really dives into how so much of our evangelical culture and some of our beliefs come more from the Victorian era and Victorian literature and Victorian history and culture and things like that, as opposed to coming from Jesus and the apostles. And one of those things mm, that really yeah, yeah. struck me mm -hmm. was the idea of manners and how every culture has, you know, social mm. faux pas and things that you shouldn't do and things that are polite to do and things like that. But our kind of version of etiquette comes straight from Victorian England and this idea that any person can yeah. be like nobility if they put on a certain set of, of manners and etiquette. And so at that time, some of the best selling mm -hmm. books in the Western world were here's how to have good etiquette because that was a goal to attain to really honestly. And the goal was to act like you were wealthy, even though you were poor, that was, that was the, that was the agenda. And so I think oftentimes yeah. we can mistake yeah. a good intention to mm. to have a good Christian spirit by avoiding certain words. We can mistake that for actually treating people well and as images of God and mistake it for a, a good heart condition as well because we're actually just trying to have good manners as, as opposed to actually treating people the way Christ would treat them. And the craziest thing is, is having good manner, manners for your social, for the social social order and structure that you, that for you sure. live in for is sure. not a bad thing. In fact, that could be a very godly thing. Um, I'm trying to think of that, that there's like a famous missionary to China who, who he, he spent a long time in the, the nation 
being an Englishman, trying to minister to and convert those who are native to uh, the area of China that he was in. And it wasn't until he, he took a step back and began to conform his dress, his speech, and his lifestyle to aligning with the culture that he was able to begin ministry in, in, in full. C.S. Lewis talks about this too. He uses modesty as an example. He talks about like if, if you're in an, you know, a particular culture that doesn't wear clothes, modesty can't mm. mean that you put right. clothes on. You know, modesty is, is there must still be a, a way to mm -hmm. be modest and be naked. That, that there's not a correlation between this. Yeah. Modesty is a social structure. So when the Bible says to, to be modest, it's right. not, you, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it's saying to right. understand the culture and, and to be in alignment with that culture's version of modesty as a mm -hmm. way of honoring and, and there are that culture. cultures that that's he's not making it up like there are cultures that don't dress yes. the way we dress and show a lot more skin than we do yeah and so it can't be like well good right. christians wear shirts you know like th that may make so what he's saying is is like in this cultural mm -hmm. context modesty may look different and we need to understand and adjust that biblical principle to the cultural context not saying that the word changes but it's a heart posture and an attitude mm -hmm. in, in that way and so here in the United States, I do adhere to my the best I can. Of course, the being polite and being kind and aligning with the cultural norms, not because taking a shower every day <laughs> makes me a good Christian, but because there's an expectation that I'm yeah, gonna smell fresh yeah. when I go to the grocery store, and that's an act of love, if possible for for me, you know. And um, but it also may mean that because, and this is the interesting thing, because we're in America. And this is true in many other nations around the world. We live in a very mm -hmm. diverse cultural environment. And so the question I think is, is, is somebody in the church willing to adjust their behavior when they go to one right. birthday party to a different birthday party or, or right. one community to a different community, you know? And so the, the reason I bring this up is if cursing becomes our end all be all, and we think that's like, you know, this is, this is the norm that a Christian has. Then when we're maybe in a different biblical community of people who still love Jesus and they're using those words, we're going to make yeah. judgment statements about right. them that are wildly off. And in fact, those judgment statements may lead us to using non-curse right. words to describe them in a way that puts us in yeah. danger yeah. of the fires of hell. So earlier right? I talked about how certain words can take what is sacred and desacralize them. I think we can do the exact same thing with this posture towards all curse words where curse words can be an indicator of a kind of person that you are, maybe the type of place you came from, mm -hmm. the type of background mm -hmm. you have, the type of parents you have, the type of social circles you spend time in. And when we think of somebody that does not cuss, we think of a certain kind of person or groups of people. When you think of people that do cuss, mm -hmm. you think of other types of people. And so the the paradox here is that when when we again with a good intention seek to avoid using certain words because we think it makes us not pure oftentimes i think what we're really avoiding is appearing like certain other groups of people that aren't like us and if that is our mm -hmm. posture and the motivation of our heart to not curse i think we're missing the boat if our goal is to yeah. To have conversations with what is the phrase from scripture seasoned with salt where kind of, you know, flavorful mm -hmm. conversations that edify and build up and add flavor to people's lives. I think that is a, a good intention and a good reason not to curse. And that's, I, I don't curse. I should, I should add, but I think if the reason for that is because, well, I don't want to look like those kind of people, what we're really doing with trying to be holy and pure by not cursing, what we're really doing there is saying I'm better than them. And so we are desacralizing what is sacred in the eyes of God, which is the image yes. of God in those other people that look yeah. nothing like us. So we just, again, we need to be yeah. really careful with our heart posture. Why are we doing what we're doing and why are we avoiding what we're yep. avoiding? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, two more things before we wrap. So I think, yeah. so I got a review here. So guideline one, right? Do, do not use any language that could harm or degrade someone. I think we kind of like cover that really, really well. I think the second thing is, is to use language that is mm. true. If you're catching my riff, speak the truth in love, you know? And so the love is making sure that we're, we're only building up. Yeah. But the second thing is, is to say things that are true. And I'm going to use a very non-spiritual quote here. <laughs> 
I remember reading the book, Stephen King, who I'm maybe not as huge a fan of, but he wrote a book called On Writing. And he said something in that book that really stuck with me. And he was talking about cursing in fiction. And, uh, you know, I guess the time that he was writing, he got a lot of flack from that. And he's not someone who, who I, I think has has vocalized a relationship with Jesus. But he just talked about this idea. He was like, when writing a book, tell the truth. And if you have a plumber who smacks his thumb with a hammer, he's not going to say sugar sticks, which is, I think is actually where I got that from when I said a sugar sticks earlier. I think it was that quote. You know, he's going to use really foul, quote, quote unquote, culturally foul language. I bring it up yeah. because, you know, I'm, I'm an author or an aspiring author and, and I'm writing fiction. And this sticks in my head a lot. Mm-hmm. In Christian art, because there's a desire to avoid certain words for a perception of piety, we don't tell the truth, I think, in a lot of our art. And, and I really care about this. You know, like Christian movies is an example that would feature a type of individual that they want to portray, but that individual is not represented accurately on screen because they are Christian washed, I guess, culturally Christian washed. You paint over them enough so they don't become the person they are anymore, but now they're the person who's acceptable and palpable. I really care about this, you know, when when it comes to Christian music, fiction, and and for the record, there's a a time and a place, right? So like if Hillsong comes out with Mm -hmm. a song, I probably don't want it to drop an F-bomb. But... I remember when King's Kaleidoscope, which is one of my favorite bands, released an album called Beyond Control. Mm-hmm. And they, there was an explicit version of the album. that The album ended with a song called A Prayer. It was a song wrestling with feelings of fear and death. And it uses the F word. It's really and good. I needed that song. And I needed that F word. And I know that may sound controversial to people, but you know, me and my wife had just experienced our first miscarriage. I was, re- I was hurt. Like I was hurt, hurt. I felt like the Lord really didn't see me. And this song is broken into two parts where the first part is this person wrestling this is where the, the curse words are used. This is really somber. And then there's this overture and then it turns mm-hmm. to the response of Christ. And I yeah. needed it. I mean, that song helped me. It was one of the many tools the Lord used in that season to help keep me exactly holding on to the faith, you know? And I know it sounds silly. Mm. You know, like, well, couldn't they've used a different word? First off, that's a silly question in my opinion that's the word they used and that's the, their art but also no no i honestly think other words would not have hit the depth because there's there's cultural connotations to the f word that yeah. allow me to understand the visceralness of the feeling being yeah. communicated with that word and i needed it i needed it and it helped me feel seen and understood and gave me a an anchor that somebody else was to some extent understanding that pain mm. and I, I needed it. So I, in my opinion, and sometimes in the telling of art, in the creating of art and the telling of stories, and the, that is the language that is given to us by our culture and to tell that story with truth, those are the words needed. And to take those tools right. out of the artist's toolbox is deeply problematic. And so when God opens the door in, in two years or so mm-hmm. and my book hits the bookshelves, it will include words that may be considered by some to be offensive because that's the story that needs to be told and that's the truth to that story. I don't know. Maybe I'm preaching yeah, too much, but I yeah. really am passionate I don't think that. there's anything wrong with that. And I think this is the kind of conversation that, and I hope there's nobody that, that turned on this podcast and heard the beginning and heard you say, Christians can cuss, it's okay, and then shut it right back off. Because I, I think this is the exact kind of conversation that is hard to wrestle with the nuance and the difficulty and and the discomfort in a conversation like this to get to the meat of Mm. that i think valuable meat of what is the heart posture and what is the reason behind what we're why we're doing what we're doing rather than just christians don't do this and that's all there is to it because behavior and attitudes and perceptions and all those things are caught more than they're taught and we should really understand why do i have this impulse to avoid those words is it because I'm actually honoring Christ or is it just something that I caught culturally? And so I think this kind of conversation, this kind of work, this kind of deep thought is really valuable. And so I want to thank you for um, having the idea for this this conversation. Yeah. We have to have one more thing because somebody's been thinking, Phil, you haven't talked about Ephesians and there's a line, there's a verse and it's uh, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up 
others according to their needs that they may benefit those who listen. And, and I just, I feel like we need to address that term just because I feel like there's so many people who, who've been listening and like, this has been like the, but Phil, this verse says it should be equated to you can't curse. And I deeply respect that viewpoint and maybe I am wrong, but this verse is like many other verses as a context around it. And the context is the F word did not exist. Cursing in, in the context that we have now in its form did not exist at the time that this was penned. So to say that it prevents cursing is difficult. I think it more aligns, especially as you, you look at the verse in context with what Paul's saying around it, it aligns more with not slandering, not telling sexual jokes, jokes that degrade the human experience and, and people mm -hmm. and not using language that degrades humans. And so this is where we get to the parameters that we set earlier. So I do think that a curse word could be unwholesome talk. I also think that calling someone stupid mm -hmm. because of who they voted for is unwholesome talk. Actually, I would think that, that judging someone harshly because they use curse words is unwholesome talk. That these are, this is what Paul is referring to. And this is, I think, what Paul means in the next verse when he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Paul, what does that mean? Next verse, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, and every, uh, along with every form of malice. And you know what you should do? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. So is it possible in a moment of deep compassion mm. to use a curse word? Um, yeah, it's, I guess it's possible. Like, and it's gracious. I mean, and maybe that's not. We're not telling you to curse. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not telling you to curse. But cursing does not indicate a lack of kindness or compassion or love or forgiveness. They're just not directly correlated. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a deeper, more thoughtful correlation between our language and our heart posture. And saying cursing is bad is is too blanket. And it's that type of lack of depth in our seriousness of our walk that I think means that we're, we aren't really working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, we're taking some easy ways out. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's ever anybody's intent, but I think that's what happens. And so it feels hot. I'll take. be honest. I feel like I disagreed for the first like three minutes, but the longer we went, I was like, oh. <laughs> uh. The Living Room Disciple podcast exists to explore the ways we are formed by our experiences, our culture, our beliefs, and our habits. And we are passionate about seeing followers of Jesus transformed to live as Jesus lived. For more information or to support our work, visit livingroomdisciple.com today. We want to thank Micah Pop for producing the podcast, Eric Church for getting it to you, and Daniel Ramirez for composing the music. And thank you for listening to the Living Room Disciple podcast, where discipleship finds a home.